I'm not going to build up John's uh, talk, although I don't want to steal any of the but you have the bar and you can get ahead or whatever. But John's done this talk before. He does a wonderful job with it. He's actually expanded it this year for us, so too. So he's got some new and interesting things. John, you take questions along the way, too, right? Absolutely. So you raise your hand. And I'll be happy to answer, or at least attempt to answer it for you. I'm going to question once in a while, but none of us can answer or qualify. <coughs> Without further ado, let's go ahead and John Ensworth. All right, make sure that, yeah, the mic's on. That's good. The mic sounds good. You're picking a different side. Ah, glasses. All the better to see it by. So, yeah, this is a uh, expanded edition because of a question last year. Uh, yes. Too loud? Yes, do you hear me? Yes, testing, yeah, yep. All right, so, yeah, someone asked a really good question last year. So the uh, last about third or so is new material. Uh, I've also kind of tweaked and updated things throughout. So, oh, I don't think that one's hooked up to the mic, is it? The source of Christmas music. So anyways, I'm John Innsworth and um, I work for the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, and that means I'm a NASA contractor, and I'm in charge of all the educational products that come out of NASA. I review them and make sure that the science is right, they're communicating correctly to the audience that they say they are, so you don't get high-level astrophysics taught to first graders. It's probably not going to work well. Um, I teach at a bunch of other places like the University of Phoenix also just because, goodness, there's just too many extra hours in the day. You've got to do something with them. So. All right, so we're used to looking at a Christmas tree and seeing a star on top. And the first year, there wasn't a tree, uh, star on top of the tree here. They got one for me. So thank you very much. Your kind donations made that star possible. And there's a star leading three guys on camels. Pretty common picture. Or standing over the little town of Bethlehem. Or sitting on somebody's business card. So, <laughs> so this, the star has been in songs and stories and part of history for, well, since 2,000 years. Um, so it's, it's worth talking about. It is a star, kind of puts it in the realm of astronomy. And this is an astronomical place, so we like to talk about it when possible. Now, to start right off, of course, it could have been just, just a miracle, that's not a good way to put it, but it could be just light that God made. So like here on the Ark of the Covenant, that, that is a, a very hard to find still shot from Raiders of the Lost Ark. So. If it's that, then the talk is over here. Thank you for coming. Uh, but I think we have more to say about it. So uh, I referred to in previous years to the gospel and the stars and astrology in Judaism and said, you'll have to just see that some other time. But that's what I've largely added back in tonight. So you'll get this. Um, we'll, we'll see what the star might have been. So to really get on the path and jump in here, let's find out when Jesus was born because that kind of nails things down a lot and everybody probably assumes zero, right? Zero BC, that's where we have BC and, and AD. Well, you know, that's probably a 33 year span there. It's a little confusing, but uh, back then talking about zero could get you in trouble. Zero was an evil number, secret knowledge, zero. So actually we go from 1 BC to 1 AD. Why would people be upset about zero? What's so bad about zero? And what? I forgot. You forgot, okay. <laughs> All right, um, what's zero divided by five? Zero, okay, that's pretty easy. Yeah, how many fives go into zero? Oh, zero. What's five divided by zero? How many zeros fit into five? Zero. Oh no. It could it's infinity. Ooh. You can't just let the general public talk about infinity. They could get ideas and create Netflix or something. But 
So we don't have the year zero, so there's a, a missing little piece there that we expect. <coughs> this is the time when the Roman Empire was really on the move. They were expanding fast, had a control over a large part of the Mediterranean region. They were heading outward into the surrounding uh, countries that we now uh, have, and we'll see that on maps in a little bit. But uh, in Judea, uh, where all the important stuff with, uh, in Bethlehem was going on, uh, Herod ruled, and he was a nasty uh, individual. So uh, we kind of need to know when he ruled. And we don't know historically when his rule started, when um, uh, <coughs> Caesar put him in charge, but we do have some idea of maybe when he died, and that can help us narrow things down a little bit. So maybe he took the throne about 38 BC. Um, Josephus is a Roman historian that gives us a lot of uh, outside um, confirmation of historical events that happened in these 10 BC to 0 to 30, 40 AD years. So we have a confirmation of biblical events from him. Herod died at the time of a, a full um, yeah, lunar eclipse, full moon, yes, but lunar eclipse. And the one closest to the, this time period that matches this is March 13th of 4 BC. Happened about 5 in the morning, uh, so people going out right before sunrise could have seen it happen. So, <laughs> Christ was born while Herod was still king. He died in in um, uh, 4 BC, so the birth of Jesus had to come before this. So we have kind of narrowed it down a little bit here. We've chopped off the fours and the threes, twos, and zero area uh, for the birth of Christ. We know that what made Joseph and Mary head to Bethlehem uh, to be counted was a census. They had to go to uh, his hometown and be counted and taxed. And so the censuses we have record of go 27 BC, 7 BC, and 14 AD. Wouldn't that be nice to have taxation only then, not every April? Um, so the 7 BC one uh, hits the best there. Now, they didn't have internet and satellite communication and things like that, so once the tax was declared, it, the news had to spread out and had to get to people, and then they had to pack up their stuff and move and get traveling to wherever they had to go. So it took a while. It was a multi-year process. So here's about three or four years here that I'm going to kind of cover with this, this sense, census. All right, we know also from the Bible that Jesus was taken into Egypt by Mary and Joseph to avoid this decree by Herod that male infants under the age of two be put to death. See, I told you he was a nasty guy. Um, so uh, he didn't come back until after Herod's death. So we can back up at least a couple of years for that. Herod had some uh, belief that he might have missed the actual birth of, of Jesus by a year or two. So he said, all the infants two and under, males, uh, out of here. And so that gives us a little smaller window, knocks it down to about the 7 to 5 BC area. Uh, taking some more time clues from the Bible, we can see in Luke that uh, Jesus started his ministry about age 30. Uh, he started in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius in Luke. Uh, he makes, uh, gets an argument with the Pharisees, and they, we get a dating to the uh, construction of the temple from that. And so 28 AD was roughly Jesus' 32nd birthday, so that knocks his birthday down to about 6 to 5 BC. So we're, we're narrowing in kind of nicely here. Can we go further? Can we maybe say the time of year that Jesus was born? 
Well, the Bible says Jesus was born while the shepherds were in the fields keeping watch of their flocks. This is when the babies were being born. Now, sheep can have, I looked this up on Google, sheep can have babies at any time, and there's even big arguments about why you would want to have a fall sheep rather than a spring sheep born, but most of naturally occurs in the springtime. But that's kind of strange. I mean, you guys are here, we're a few days away from Christmas, we got trees up, it's cold outside, it's December. So, definitely not springtime. So something seems broken here. But um, we'll get to that in just a second. <coughs> Spring of 6 BC seems to be the closest we can get uh, to the birth of Christ here. So, this December, that we are celebrating his birthday in uh, comes from patterns in the sky. The sun travels along a weird, lazy, wavy pattern because, and we'll see a picture in just a minute, the Earth's axis is tilted and all the planets and the sun and the moon travel around pretty much in a flat disk. So if you tilt something, that means at times it's higher and times it's lower in the sky. This is called the ecliptic. And down here in December is when the sun is at the bottom. So we have very long nights, very short days right now. The reverse happens in June when you have nice, hot, long days. <coughs> so around December 21st, the winter solstice, the uh, sun is at the bottom of that trip through the sky from our point of view. And of course, people just naively charting that look at might go, oh no, the sun's going to keep going and be gone forever. That'd be horrible. That would. It would be, yes. Exactly, it'd be dark. You'd have to leave your Christmas lights up all the time just to see stuff. Um, it would be Christmas all the time. That's not bad. <laughs> so, the uh, Romans were sophisticated enough to know that the sun was coming back up because it did every year, and, and everybody pretty much caught on to that. But, you know, having some type of ceremony to urge the sun back up, which could easily become a big party, um, is pretty much common around the world. So in Rome, they call it the Saturnalia. And we'll see why Saturn, the word Saturn is figured in there in just a minute. But that became a big celebration time. In some calendars, because you can't take the, uh, an even number like 30 and just divide the year up into nice months of 30 and have it come out nice, you have some leftover number of days there. Some cultures would just put on a big old free time at the end of the year and everybody just forgot everything, had party time and then got back to work on January 1st. So, you know, it was a good reason to do this. So, Christians of course were getting persecuted pretty quickly. Things got pretty bad, and if they wanted to celebrate the uh, birth of Christ, you could kind of go under the radar when everybody else is partying all over the place and businesses are shut down and like that. So that's main thinking behind how Christmas drifted back to the time of the Saturnalia. Now it's the 25th and not the 21st, because if you're making observations as best as you can of what the sun is doing each day, by the 25th, you can definitely tell the sun is coming back up. So, like, okay, now we're safe, let's have a party, so. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get into this idea a little bit later, but um, <clears throat> could there be something in the heavens prepared to bring, um, Magi over, and that's what we're going to play with here. So, this star. The word star to us is a ball of hydrogen and helium way out in the universe that's burning from nuclear fusion and tremendous amounts of gravity holding together and pressure in the center, and the light comes across empty space to us only visible at night because the sun is not illuminating the atmosphere. That's not how they thought 2,000 years ago. So, 
A star was anything interesting happening in the sky. It could be a dot, it could be a moving dot, it could be dots that get close together, it could be the moon doing something with a dot in the sky. All those things were stars. You had fixed stars, you had falling stars, bearded stars, wandering stars, and like that. So could these have been the uh, um, Star of Bethlehem? Well, falling stars, meteors as we call them, uh, surely can look like a, about as bright as a star, or even brighter sometimes. There's a nice uh, uh, bolide here, big flash of light as this comes in. Most of these are little grains of sand, specks of dust, moving tens of miles per second. I didn't say hour, I said second. Uh, and they hit the atmosphere and they burn up due to friction. So go ahead and put your hands together. Hey, I got my first applause. Yeah. All right. And of course your hands are cold, so rub them together. Rub, 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 rub. Okay, feel that warmth? Okay, that's friction. Well, these little things coming in, you can stop now. Uh, these little things coming in are coming in so fast that they actually f flash into light. They pretty much burn up. Some bits of rock come down. Dust is coming down all the time. The earth is putting on, oh, tens of tons of new space material every week. So if you were like me and didn't clean the house all year long and the relatives are coming for Christmas and you vacuumed everything up, you'd vacuum up a few ounces of space dust that's drifted in every time you open the door. Kind of cool. It's a good reason not to clean your house. So <laughs> my wife won't let me get away with it. I'm saving space dust. So, but these things are short. These are very common. This is not enough to, to bring magi all the way over to... Uh, to <laughs> Israel. They probably came from what, the region that we now call Iran. This is Persian region. <coughs> and they probably had months of travel time to get over to uh, Israel. So yeah, it had to be something that lasted a little longer than, than a meteor. A bearded star though, what would you call that? A comet, yep. Comets are bigger, many miles or even maybe 10 miles or greater, conglomerations of rock and frozen ices and gases. We're really getting an idea now of what some of these are made of because what just happened a few weeks ago? What? You looked kind of on an asteroid. Yes, uh, an asteroid. We've done that too. Comet. Comet, yes. The Rosetta mission. Uh, so we're trying to get measurements of what's coming off of a comet as it rides along with it going around the sun. So you're going to get lots of interesting stories about what comets really are made of. We have this dirty snowball idea that we do demonstrations on and, and talk sometimes. We'll find out if we've been doing it right all uh, soon. Um, so that's a pretty good, I mean these can hang up in the sky for months. You can see them drifting night after night slowly through the stars. As they get close to the sun they go a little quicker maybe pop out the other side of the sun in the morning sky instead of the night, or the night sky instead of the morning, something like that. Halley's Comet is one of the more famous ones. <coughs> Here it is pictured in the, uh, 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 how do you say that, Bio-France tapestry, talking about the Norman Conquest. And they are, these people are amazed, it says, at this bearded star that's up in the sky. Now one major problem with comets is that they're usually omens of doom. They, they, when these things showed up, kings would decide not to go out and, and wage war and people would be worried about plagues coming and economic collapse and stuff. And, and so, yeah, using that as a foreteller of the coming king of, of Israel or king of the Jews is um, probably not very likely. So here is Omen, even be, Omen of Evil before the Battle of Hastings. Um, medieval England is very upset about that. And we also don't have a record of any great comets uh, around that time in the time leading up to the birth of Jesus. We have pretty good records from astrologers from the Arabia, Persian area, Babylonian area, and Chinese astrologers. That was their job, was to see what was going on up there. They didn't maybe understand any of the physics, 
But they made records and they, you know, a lot of that stuff has survived and someone would have seen a major comet. Another possibility would be a, a fixed star or a new star. These are really old stars. These are stars at the end of their lives. When you have some medium-sized stars that blow off their material or even uh, explode and leave behind a white dwarf or a neutron star and there happen to be in a system with another star that's younger or at least lighter, not younger, but lighter and not yet ready to die. They can pull material in that builds up on a disk and explodes and you get for days or weeks a new star up in the sky. And the big stars can explode and let off a tremendous amount of light even in the daytime, and then we call those supernovas. Uh, July 4th, 1054 AD, really famous guest star appeared, brighter than the full moon, you could see it in the daytime, and that's left behind an explosion remnant called the Crab Nebula in the horns of Taurus. So there's a picture from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, and there's a neutron star in there spinning quickly, putting out pulses of radio noise and like that. That's possible, but we have, again, looking at the records from the astrologers, only five such events, and none uh, are really close to the time of Christ's birth. So these same Arabian, Persian, Babylonians would have been the ones we would turn to uh, the oldest recorded supernova is Chinese astrologers back in 8, 185 AD. Their earliest records of sunspots go back to the BC years. So we, they were looking, they were looking up in the sky and watching this stuff. We have a, a Halley's Comet appearance from 240 BC recorded. So, yep, definitely would have heard of something very large in the sky like that. So maybe we need to go deeper to figure out what this could be. So who saw the star? Maybe this will help us narrow it down. Uh, we don't see any evidence in the Bible that Mary and Joseph saw it. The shepherds didn't see it. They saw angels while they were taking care of their sheep, but no star. King Herod didn't see it because he had to ask the wise men, who are they, uh, what that was and what it said. So it wasn't something going, go, hey, wow, look at that. Um, and as we'll see, other cultures far away didn't see it, and that's the new stuff tonight. We're going to look around who else was on the earth at the time and play with that. The only ones we know for, for sure saw are these wise men. So let's see. Also known as the Magi. Yes, question. Yeah, if it was something really low, like right over, over the town, again, something miraculous, that just hovering in the air over there, then yeah, that would have been a local event. But th yet, they led the Magi all the way out of the Iran region, so something they could see. So yeah, okay, we'll get to that. <laughs> so the word Magi, um, root of our modern English words magic and magician, they were astrologers of the Zoroastrian religion. And as high priests of the religion, it was their job to try to predict stuff happening out there, which was really hard because Newton came along a lot later. Um, just as a side note, we got we three kings and lots of threes out there on the picture earlier, or your, maybe your Christmas cards that you sent out. Um, that's really based on their three gifts at gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, in Eastern Christianity, uh, sex, they're actually up to 12 magi, so who knows? We don't really know how many there were. They're even named and everything, and none of that really, there's any historical basis for it. It's just a uh, um, tradition to, to actually build a lot into these magi, but uh, we do know that they were astrologers, and they spent their time looking at these five wandering stars. Anybody know what the wandering stars are? What's a wandering star? Haven't mentioned that yet. Yeah, no? Planets. Planets, yep, thank you very much. Um, so they looked at these planets, trying to predict where they were going to do and where they were going to go and predict what the future is going to be. Jupiter 
goes around the sun every 12 years, Saturn every 30, and they pass each other every 20 years. And that sets the stage for something interesting. If Star of Bethlehem was not some supernatural event, it uh, wasn't one of our other little star-like things up there. And since these were astrologers, sorcerers of the time, they had prophecies in their religion, and there were prophecies in um, the uh, Hebrew tradition, like this one, Numbers 24, says a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter or king will rise out of Israel. We have a uh, commentary that expands on this, uh, saying that uh, you could read this as a star steers its course unto Jacob, then a scepter bearer shall rise up in Israel. Uh, the star will be an index finger pointing to the prophesied owner of the scepter. Okay, so remember, this is way back in Old Testament writings here. Um, so what we see looking back with software and recreating the sky of the past is a rare triple conjunction. A conjunction is just a close pass between two of these stars, between Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter's meaning was the king of the planets. Um, it was Mar Marduk to the Babylonians, Zeus to the Greeks. And Saturn was the harvester or reaper, or the god Cronus, or the god of time. So that Saturnalia that we had a little bit ago, it's the time to party. So great, great use of the word there. So and that happened in the constellation Pisces. And to the Zoroastrians, this was the house of the Hebrews. They had the regions around them mapped to the uh, constellations in the sky. So they would have read this probably as the uh, time of the harvester has come, the king of the Hebrews is arriving at the dawn of the age of Pisces. Let's get into all that in just a second. So here's Jupiter and here's Saturn. And they do loops in the sky. How many people knew that planets do loops in the sky? All right, I got a few hands. Why would a planet do a loop? Isn't it just going around the sun? Yes, why? Yep, that, that's true. And what gives this loop is an optical illusion. Okay, so you're in your car, you're going down the freeway, you're driving home to grandma's for Christmas. And you see over in the right lane, a semi truck up there. You're in the left lane going along at 80. You wouldn't go 80, would you? 80 miles an hour. And the semi truck is definitely going forward. And then it seems to kind of slow down. And then it goes be backwards as you pass it. And then when you look in your rear mirror, you can still, still see the truck is going forward. It's still driving in the right lane at 55 because it's afraid of getting tickets or something. Um, but in that point, when you and the faster car pass the truck, it looks like it's going backwards. And so as us, Earth, closer to the sun, we're going faster than Jupiter and Saturn. As we pass Jupiter and Saturn, they look like they go backwards. It's called retrograde motion. And it, uh, it was a real difficult thing for even astronomers to deal with later. So they came up with complex wheels and things to try to explain why things went backwards. That is, if you leave the Earth in the center of the solar system. Once you take that out of the equation, put the sun in the middle, everything works nicely. It makes sense. But they didn't know any of that. All they saw were planets did slow loops over weeks and months uh, in the sky. So a few constellation, a few, a few concepts before we go into this. Constellations are, anybody want to define those real quick? What's a constellation? Yeah. Uh, a group of stars that looks like a picture or pictures. Yeah, a group of stars that you kind of do a dot to dot to make a picture. Um, if you look around through cultures and nations and see what they what they did, everybody had their own. We now have an official 88 constellations decided in the 20s by the International Astronomical Union. But before that, it was a free for all, kind of like apps on an Android device. Uh, sorry, how to get there. Um, and Sometimes constellations overlapped, and this, this nation or group of people used parts of what this group of people called one constellation. But constellations also kind of bright things all kind of grouped together naturally. There's a clumpiness up there. So some constellations kind of stay their own thing throughout. 
A conjunction, like I said, is two things passing. Let's do some pictures here. So there's pictures of constellations in older star maps. These are very pretty and ornate, lots of artwork. Nowadays, we just put the dots down and say, oh, that's Pegasus. Okay. So a little more functional, not quite so artistic. Conjunction is any two things close in the sky. And how close really isn't defined. It's not official. Um, how close can be just, does it make you go, oh, wow, that, those two things are close. That, that's enough. Uh, the zodiac is the circle of constellations that the sun seems to travel through and the moon and the planets seem to travel through because everything is like a BB's going around on a plate on a nice big flat disc. And so what we call your sign is what is behind the sun right now, or the day you're born actually. Um, that's off because of a wobble in the earth, but we won't get into that earth's axis. But uh, throughout a year, the sun travels through all these uh, constellations and the planets are doing their own thing as well. So the ecliptic is this line through the sky. It's that lazy, uh, wavy thing that I showed you on the earlier map. When you put everything together, the Earth's equator is this nice circle around and the path of the sun and the moon and the planets goes to a high point and a low point just because we're tilted, 23 and a half degrees. That's what gives us seasons. If it wasn't for that, you'd have the same weather every day. Well, maybe thunderstorms one day and not the next, but uh, no great exciting seasons and snow and no snow and things like that. So it's nice to have some tilt. All right, so what we're going to see now are a couple simulations um, using software of what Saturn or Jupiter were doing in the 7 BC to 6 BC time frame. Oh, not yet. Sorry. So we're going to be looking right here, and kind of right there at the edge of the map, at an important point called <coughs> the vernal equinox. The sun is on the way up, it crosses the equator, that's the first day of spring. The autumnal equinox out here is where the sun's on the way down. The sun's going through this through the year, this direction. That's the beginning of fall, right in the middle of the chart there. So right over here is the vernal equinox. So I'll go ahead and go forward. And we're going to start <coughs> March 22nd, 7 BC. You can see the sun is on the vernal equinox, so it's the first day of spring. Oh, March 22nd, makes sense. And here's Saturn and Jupiter right here. Here's the constellation of Pisces, a little V going up and up through here. You can go ahead and hit play. It, I've got a whole bunch of lead time built in for this chatty part. Up here is the constellation of Pegasus. Along here is the Earth's equator, so if you're standing on the equator looking straight up, this would be what's overhead. And this green line is the path of the sun and the moon and the planets. This is the flat disk of our solar system with its tilt because we're tilted. So watch Jupiter, watch Saturn right here, and it'll get moving in just a moment. I want to darken it, that's going to be good, just for these. Got Uranus and Mercury here too. Mercury would have been pretty close to the sun. This would have been starting out when it was uh, still pretty bright. Yep, it's getting there. I just fill until it starts to animate. <laughs> and they didn't know Uranus existed. So here we go. Here's keep your eye on Jupiter. Here comes Saturn down here. Pass number one. Here comes pass number two. Here comes pass number three, I think. Or I miss it. Yeah. And down it goes. And here comes the sun in the evening with Mars coming up here, and <coughs> we've gone almost an entire year. So it's going to do it again, so just keep watching. That's me spacing from a couple years ago. And we'll hop back a year. There's Saturn and Jupiter. Keep an eye on Saturn. Saturn's name vanishes for a moment here, so you just got to kind of pass number one. Pass number two. This is taking a whole year to happen. Pass number three. And now we're up to the spring of 6 BC. Jupiter's right in the sun. 
Yeah, as he gets really close right here. So if you'll go, let's, see, let's go to this one, and we can zoom in. Go ahead and hit play. And here's March 20. Oh, sorry, do it again. I hit the wrong thing. I didn't hit the laser. I hit the forward. So here's Saturn and Jupiter zoomed in. We're going from March 22nd uh, to March 10th, 6 BC, from 7 to 6. And it kind of gets funny when you're doing slides in the BC years because back in time is a bigger number. Right? You just have to keep that in mind. So there goes Saturn, pass one, pass number two, pass number three. All right, yay, it worked this year. Thank you very much. You can bring the lights up a little. So how rare is that? How uh, unusual is that? Stop it with the laser. Uh, on average, it happens about every 450 years. Um, doing my best playing with my software and what other people have on different websites. These are the years that something kind of like a triple conjunction happened. Oh, thank you. Whoa, yeah, that's bright. So you can see these, the Zoroastrian religion really got launched between 250 BC and maybe two, uh, 450 BC to 250 BC, kind of really congealed over those centuries. So and I looked at this one and they pass once and then kind of do a distant dance for their next two quote-unquote conjunctions. Not very good compared to the one in seven, no, oh, now it's batteries dying, seven BC. And then after that, you're much further into the future. So only 14 in 2,800 years, that is a pretty rare event. There are other theories out there that you can find on the website. Oh, let me go back once, once more. Um, on, out in, in the great internet where nothing is ever untrue, there are lots of other dates uh, for this to happen. If you put it in software and play with it, uh, a lot of them actually didn't happen. In fact, they're completely across the sky from each other. So I, I think some of those got written before people could do their own simulations on their own computer at home. So beware of everything on the internet. Um, so other ideas out there are lunar eclipse, where the moon eclipsed Jupiter <coughs> in Aries. Uh, but that happened in 6 BC. It's really called an occultation. It's a, maybe a little late uh, for uh, this to, uh, for Magi to get up and going. And the other ones here even uh, later, you got a conjunction between Jupiter and Regulus. In 3 BC, Jupiter and Venus did a little dance in June. Of 2 BC, Saturn and Jupiter um, did a thing in 66 BC, but uh, wasn't triple conjunction. So there are other possibilities out there, but the timing's not quite right to our earlier work. Um, with Mars joining Jupiter and Saturn, as I pointed out right at the end, one could further read meaning in that the, the warrior king is coming uh, and it's his time to come. So but that would have been late, late for them to get going. Just a quick side trivia thing in, in the old little town of Bethlehem, the lyrics are, O morning stars together proclaim thy holy birth. The holy birth, sorry. So yeah, even they have plural, those two things up there. So getting the time put together here, uh, we have a Roman census back here, stretching forward. Census reached Palestine in 7 BC, the first appearance of the star. Spring of 7 BC, Magi get traveling, taking a few months. Got the second appearance of the star that would really motivate them. The uh, third appearance of the star happens right at, around his birth uh, in this little span right here. Herod's order to kill babies comes here. Uh, they f fly, flee to Egypt, death of Herod, and they return from Egypt in 4 BC. So it kind of is the best work I can put together on, on the timing here. So from, this is new material now. This is where we ended in the past. Um, someone asked, what about other cultures and other religions? Anybody else see this or talk about it? So this is jumping into a little more detail of what the world looked like at the time. In 6 BC, we had only about 200 million people on the entire earth. Numbers vary, but that seems to be the, uh, the major consensus number for the estimated population. U.S. today is about 320 million. 
So we have a lot more in the United States now than the entire Earth did. And the world today is 7.2 billion. So we're not talking a lot of people that you're working with. If you put up a map like this, you can see the colored areas here are where we had some civilizations or maybe just the beginning of a civilization out there. You can see right around the Mediterranean and then over in India, China is basically the hub of civilization. We have a little bit in Central South America and, and like that. If you go into more detail, there are little tribe, tribal regions, little outposts of humanity around, but very few records from 2,000 years ago survive from little tribal communities. Most of these are archaeological finds, so if we need records, we need to go to the bigger civilizations. So looking at the Persian Empire and per Middle East region, well, this is where the Magi came from. So they were very much uh, involved. Uh, <coughs> the um, Parthian, if I'm saying that correctly, Empire, I'm a scientist, not a historian, so I won't pronounce everything correctly. Uh, stretched from about 247 BC to 224 AD, and they had the prophecy of and the account of the star. Roman Empire was about 1 million people at this point. Uh, Italy alone had 800,000 people, the old boot right down here. Um, Josephus is our major non biblical historian from the time. He has a, a writing called The Jewish War. And that reference point in it, he talks about a comet probably, not our star. He doesn't actually record the star himself. Um, going to China, we had the Han Dynasty uh, up and running from about 600 BC to 200 AD. And uh, they record clearly Halley's Comet and another comet in 5 and 4 BC. There's one in 10. BC, but the best um, uh, historians really digging into the records think it's a, a ghost um, record, that it's a mistranslated uh, account from Halley's that just has the year wrong a little bit. Um, they have great records, but no account of a star like this. Um, over in Japan, we had the, oh boy, uh, Waiyawi, Yaoi, Yay, Yay, uh, period in Japanese islands, uh, we know of, that they existed pretty much from archaeological methods. Uh, we don't have written records uh, existing from uh, this. The Chinese did excursions over there and found uh, these old tribes of people living there, but uh, we have records of them from that, but no, no star of Bethlehem. Going to India, we have the uh, decline of the, oh boy, uh, Marian, Marian, Marian Empire in South Asia, the uh, Seda Vehana Empire, did I get that right maybe? Uh, from about 230 BC to 220 AD, we have writings, records, coins, artwork, and pottery. Um, conjunctions in the sky are recorded, but no specific star was prophesied or, or exists in their records there. Um, <coughs> looking at uh, Africa, we have basically the ancient Egypt is, is largely collapsed and gone, and we have uh, the rise of the Nubian Empire there, and basically they were getting their act together from 30 BC to 600 AD, but they were getting strong influence from Rome, Romans coming around and kind of taking everything over. Uh, going down to uh, central and southern um, Africa, I got uh, many Bushmen migrations. We have Bantu expansion, um, but again, few records, no historical record that I could find of, a, of the star. Uh, going up into Europe, uh, we have the Celts, early Celts here. Uh, the Romans are coming though, and the wave was about to sweep over them. Um, so from 450 BC up to the Roman conquest, they did have a holiday, uh, Sol Invictus which is the same as the Saturnalia, so they meshed well on that, that holiday once the Romans got there. Um, there is a British uh, Celts of Britain coin with a star on it that some people have attributed to being the Star of Wonder, um, but we think it might have been a supernova or a nova in history that was actually being uh, chronicled. All right, jumping over to this side of the Earth, the Mayan civilization was getting a uh, 
uh, rise from 2000 BC to 250 AD. Uh, no recorded observation there, but they did record the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus in 2 BC. Uh, it's been, they can, we can figure out from the records. Uh, people came across the, um, uh, come on, Bering, Bering uh, Land Bridge during the last glaciation and down in North America and down. Um, of course, there were some Vikings also that came around to the east side. Um, you had um, farming cultures and little tribal cultures around. Uh, you had on the <coughs> western side of the Andes, the Andean civilization. Again, few records survive. I couldn't find anything uh, there, but an awful lot of real estate ready to go in uh, 10 BC uh, across South America. Uh, out into the Pacific, you had um, Polynesian migrations uh, and going out in waves. You had uh, aboriginals in Australia, but few small populations, few records surviving. Look at the, at the world religions at the time. You had Zoroastrian religion that we've already talked about, Judaism, which obviously is where uh, Old Testament and the prophecies come from. Um, a star was said to predict the birth of Krishna in Hinduism. Uh, is it Jainism, I think, 600 BC forward. Um, there's some mention of contact with Zoroastrianism, so they may have picked up some of, of their material. Uh, Buddhism in India from 500 BC forward. Uh, reincarnated spiritual leaders can be found with a star that hovers over them, so there's some, um, some link there. Uh, Taoism in China, 280 BC forward. No record I could find of, of the star importance. And the Mesoamerican religions go back to 2000 BC, but couldn't find anything there. So I did my best research. And if there is material that anyone knows of, please contact me and I'll update this for next year. Um, so going a little deeper into this, uh, these meanings, okay, there seems to be importance in the meanings of the constellations for any of this to make any sense. So where would that come from? So this leads to the one uh, whole new vein here called the Gospel and the Stars where um, modern theologians have mapped the meaning of the constellations up and saying, well, maybe this, these constellations foretell of more than just Jesus' birth. So hypothesis is that God placed meanings in patterns of the stars uh, of the zodiac on people's hearts and a desire to tell what was to come, um, salvation to all mankind. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Uh, Jeremiah 31 says, I'll put my law on their minds, write it on their hearts. Jeremiah 31 also says, He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night. So God's doing all that. In Romans, we go to New Testament here, uh, show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, consciences also bearing witnesses and their thoughts sometimes, uh, accusing them other times, defending them. Hebrews 10 also says, I'll put my laws in their minds, write them on their hearts. So we, if we can link meanings that people put to things in the sky with uh, any of these um, biblical accounts, well, maybe we might have something here. Uh, so what is astrology? It's the belief that the position of the sun, moon, and planets tells what's coming in some way. We do see astrology, uh, at least the zodiac called the Maseroth, in uh, Job 38. Um, two different translations here called the zodiac and their seasons, constellations and their seasons. And what we expect, if this is true, is that multiple people groups or religions or would have similar figures, similar meanings around the world for different constellations. Modern theologians have grouped all the constellations in the zodiac in groups of blocks of four. So we'll follow what, um, there's a number of books on this out there that you can go after. The first four talk about the nature of Christ, his work, triumph over sin and death. We start with Virgo, which is where the, um, Conjunction, triple conjunction started ne uh, <coughs> next to you. This is where the, um, this is the right, oh, it's Aries, oh, forget that part. Uh, okay, so Virgo the Virgin, or the Virgin Mary, and Egypt, this is Isis, 
uh, to the Chaldean, Ishtar, Queen of Stars, Solomon's wives in India, the mother of the great god Drishna. Uh, the Greek was the daughter of Zeus. Babylonians had a ear of corn, though. Um, Catholics in the Middle Ages did put the Virgin Mary up here. So we have birth of Christ coming from a virgin. Libra, the scales. Uh, <clears throat> the balance of justice of human affairs, so good and bad on the two sides of the scales. Uh, in Hebraic, it was scales, a balance, uh, or weighed, found wanting, all referred to from the book of Daniel. Babylonians and Greeks saw scorpion claws, China, Chinese astrologers put a dragon up here, so not a strong link right there. But the idea among modern theologians is it's a false gospel of good works versus bad works. If you do more good, then you go to heaven. Scorpius, the scorpion. Uh, the Israelites, Egy Egyptians, Mayans, Greeks, Persians, uh, Turkish people, India, Mayans, I already put them up there, Aztecs, uh, even the Polynesians use the right, bright star Antares as a scorpion. Pretty universal around. Polynesians have the overall figure as Maui's fish hook. China put another dragon there. Um, but the idea is this is the deadly foe, Satan, or the sting of death. This is at the bottom of that S shape of the ecliptic. This is the lowest point in the sky. Sagittarius is man, horse, archer, a centaur. Uh, Euphrates region, Babylonians saw a god of war, a centaur, Indian. They had a horse's head with a fan of a lion's tail, uh, part of a dragon, part of a tortoise, tortoise in China. Polynesians put a fish there. Uh, but this is the beginning of a dual nature picture where you have combination critters. You've got a picture of Christ because he's 100% man, 100% God at the same time, firing an arrow into the heart of death. Oh. Second group, this is the fruits of uh, Christ's work, position as mediator, and the relationship between him and the church. So we got a Capricorn, another goat fish. So we got a half and half thing here. Um, Bacchus's goat disguised as he uh, dove into the Nile River to hide from a monster. Uh, ancient Chinese it was a goat fish and a black tortoise. Uh, Egyptians put a water god bearing goat's horns here. It was a goat by the Persians, Turks, Syrians, and Arabian region. Um, the, in the societal islands, is a cavern of the parental yearlings, so I don't know. Some of these constellations people had were really very strange. So, another picture of, of Christ as a sacrificial lamb. Aquarius is a water bearer. So we have two buckets of water to the Arabians. Egyptians was um, monius, derived from a mawal or water. A water bucket to the Persians, Israelites, Syrians, and Chinese and Turks. Uh, Emperor Chinese uh, named it for the, a great flood that occurred during his rule. So a source of water in Christian circles, Holy Spirit's often equated to water. Pisces is a fish, another disguise for the Greek god, two fishes, uh, leader of the celestial hosts due to the position of the vernal equinox. Hebrew it was two fishes. In China it was a pig pen, so that didn't match either. Uh, thought as a sign of the church or the age of Christ. Um, also thought to be linked to the ichthyus that you see on the back of people's cars going down the road. Uh, Greek word for fish. Um, we're in the age of Pisces because the vernal equinox is there. That wobble in the Earth's axis I mentioned earlier will eventually bring about the age of Aquarius which is about 400 years away, but we still have, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Okay, that's it. It's the only singing I'm gonna do. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Aries the ram, golden ram, uh, save the life of, of Prixus, Prix I guess it is. Um, ram's horn to the Hebrews, ram or sheep to the Arabian, Syrians, Persians, and Turks. China was a bond. Lasso and Sickle, three different constellations, and Hindu um, saw the first lunar mansion there. So this is a sacrifice, the final sacrifice for humankind. The last four constellations uh, take us to God's great judgment, conclusion of the uh, plan. Taurus the bull is Jupiter or Zeus's disguise uh, as he used to uh, get Europa or is it 
I can't pronounce that, Pacifi. Uh, Druids saw this as a uh, bull. Egyptians saw a bull god Osiris. Babylonians put a bull there. Uh, Greeks and uh, had Zeus, Lakota had part of a bison. Tayam Nipa. Uh, Mayans and Aztecs put a tip of a rattlesnake tail there. So, uh, so this is the idea of the bull is actually coming out of smoke and fire in some pictures as part of a bull. It's kind of a godfather thing. Um, so you got resurrection. Scorpius is setting in the west as this rises. So it's the idea of the uh, resurrection of Christ there. Gemini the twins, you got another dual, duality thing. Babylonians saw twins, Greek mythology, Polynesian region had twins there. Chinese put a tiger bird thing there. A Lakota had a bear's teepee and devil's tower in here. Um, so Castor the judge and coming ruler, Pollux the strong uh, fighter coming. So another picture of Christ. C Cancer the crab, a crab sent by Hera to slow down Hercules. Egypt, it's the scarab. Uh, Germanic people saw a crayfish. Indian region put a lobster there. So, oh, sorry, a crab. Rome put a lobster there. Romans did. Um, and the star cluster, a beehive cluster, is known to the, uh, the Hebrew people as being a multitude or crib or manger or the descendants of Abraham. So Lakota had part of uh, Chan Shasha and a dried willow and people in winter's camp in here. So it doesn't fit into the larger picture above. Um, so fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, multitude or innumerable seed uh, coming in the future. And we end with Leo the lion, first, Hercules, uh, um, first creature Hercules had to slay. Babylonians and Egyptians had a lion here. The Greeks had a lion here. China put three enclosures in a bird. So <laughs> they don't match either. They're just not playing well with everyone. Um, so King, the Lion of the House of Judah, the end of the series and, and the end of time in Hosea and Revelation, going Old and New Testament. Um, we even get the placement of Easter uh, in the calendar because of all this uh, astronomical and astrological stuff going on. It's the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the moment the sun is on the vernal equinox, where the moment spring begins. Um, that can go from March 22nd to April 25th, depending on how, when the full moon happened and when uh, spring starts. Uh, the lunar solar calendar that the Hebrews ran everything on also determines where uh, Hanukkah occurred, occurs. Um, recently it happened to overlap Thanksgiving, and that probably won't happen again for ever or thousands of years, just based on the strangeness of how this all happens. Uh, so back to astrology and Judaism. The Bible does mention Orion, Taurus, and Pleiades, uh, and the zodiac in the sky. Um, even the 12 tribes of Israel were linked to the 12 constellations of the zodiac, again the Maseroth. And there they are all the way around with the different tribes. And if you look at how the Old Testament places the tribes in the wilderness around the tabernacle, you get even a cross-like shape. So it's kind of like, all right, old stuff predicting the stuff to come to the, in the future. So is astrology good for telling your future? No, I don't think so, but there sure are plenty of apps and things in newspapers, whatever those are, uh, to do that. Um, our heavenly body something to worship? Well, from the Tower of Babel, Babel, Babel um, Genesis, they say, let's build ourselves a city, a tower that reaches to the heavens. You can easily translate it into reaching dedicated to or unto the heavens. So it might be making this big thing to worship. The uh, Zodiac constellations brought down some wrath there, so bad news. Um, and is it essential for telling the gospel today? Um, no, I don't think so. We got a book. It's all around the world. Big, big seller. Uh, so I don't think it's really valid there for today either. Um, but from the new material this year, there does seem to be thematic connection between patterns and meanings that people put to these patterns in the sky, uh, as arbitrary as they seem to be. Um, and may have been all that was needed to communicate where these wise men would find baby Jesus. Uh, what is a miracle? Well, 
According to physics, a three-body problem where you put more than one planet into the solar system and try to predict what's going to happen thousands or tens of thousands of years later really falls apart as things become chaotic uh, in the math. You just can't. So there's only buy the nicest software and put it on the nicest computer you can. There's so many, so many tens of thousands of years back and forth you can go and still find meaning. So could have been a miraculous star, just God made a light. Could have been a miracle of putting uh, heaven's emotion away that worked in 7 and 6 BC with the meaning written on our hearts. But whatever happened, it led Magi to Jesus who was born in a major. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so, uh, So questions, so see, one, one hour, so definitely up from 35 minutes last year. Questions?